Good morning, church. Would you stand on your feet? How's everybody doing today? I don't know about you, but I'm glad that I made it through the rain to get to church, to be today with you guys, with the body of Christ. Listen, we got an awesome day ahead of us. My name is Brett, and uh, in a few minutes, we're going to sing a few songs together. If you're uh, on church online, we just want to welcome you. Thank you so much for joining us. Pastor Daniel Gray is in the house, and he's going to be bringing an awesome word. So if you're online, go ahead and message somebody. Go ahead and send them a text. Let them know to get ready to tune in to log in. I guess if you're here, you got enough time. Tell somebody to get here today at church. But listen, before we enter in and, and worship together, go ahead and just give somebody a high five. Let them know you're glad they're at church today. Introduce yourself to a couple people around you, and we'll get started in just a moment. Your name prevails, Jesus the Christ. 
church at Chapel Hill, you can be seated. You know, today we are celebrating Palm Sunday. 
Palm Sunday commemorates the day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem. And as he came to Jerusalem, his followers paved the way by cutting palm branches down and laying them on the road before him. This Friday, we'll celebrate Good Friday. Good Friday is the day that Jesus died on the cross and redeemed us, recovered our lives from sin. And then next Sunday, we're gonna celebrate Easter, the day when every claim that Jesus had made about himself he demonstrated that they were all true because although he was very dead on Friday, on Sunday he was totally and completely alive. This is Holy Week in the Christian church and we celebrate it here. Today, as a part of that celebration, we're gonna to come to the Lord's table and receive communion. At Chapel Hill, we believe that communion is meant for anyone who has invited Jesus to be the king of their heart. If you haven't made that decision yet, in just a moment, we're going to pray. And I would invite you while we're praying for you to consider inviting him to become the king of your heart today. He'll do that and you can begin a brand new life with him, something that you never before imagined was even possible. If you've made that decision, in just a moment, we're gonna invite you to come and receive the elements. And then I wanna encourage you to take them back to your seat, hold on to them, and then we'll partake together. But before we do that, I'd like us to look at a portion of a letter that Peter wrote to believers living in Asia Minor. He said this, for you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. You know, humankind doesn't have any trouble, if they're honest, acknowledging that most of what we're capable of producing in our lives is regret, guilt, and shame. It's part of that lost way, that, that, that crooked way of living handed down to us from our ancestors. And no matter what we do, no matter how we try, despite using our most valuable of possessions, silver or gold, we can't buy our way out of the consequences of our decisions. But the text that we read says that there was a sacrifice made, a price paid to redeem us, the precious blood of Christ, a lamb that was perfect, spotless, didn't have any blemishes. And in place of our shame, he offers us salvation. To cover our guilt, he gives us grace. And to replace regret, he provides redemption. As we come to the Lord's table this morning, I want us to remember the awesome price that Jesus paid to make all of those things possible for us today. May we honor and celebrate his sacrifice and remember everything that he did for us on the cross. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the sacrifice of your son. We're so grateful that you so longed for fellowship with your creation that you made the ultimate sacrifice by giving us Jesus. Jesus, we honor and we celebrate you today as our King. And we remember the awesome price that you paid to make possible for us a completely new way of life. According to your will and your way, we thank you today. And it's in your name that we pray, amen. We have tables prepared across the room and I would invite you at this time to come and receive the elements. in 
that after they had observed the Passover meal, afterwards he took bread, gave thanks, and he broke it, gave it to them and said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Would you take the bread in your hand and let's just remember for a moment the life of Jesus, his nature, his character, and all the embodiment that he represented for us. Let's partake together. The Bible says in the same way after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Would you take that cup and let's remember the awesome price that this blood paid for our lives to make possible for us a new way of life and let's drink together. Would you stand to your feet and let's celebrate the victory of the cross the power of the blood and the new life made possible through Jesus. And no one do we call you Savior. And no one do we sing your praise. And Jesus saw.
promises of God are yes and amen. All I have to do is cling to the scripture of what he's already said to be true. And I can see it by faith already happened because of who he is and what he's done on the cross through his son, Jesus. Is somebody excited about that today? Come on, church, give our God praise right now. You sound good. Thank you for singing with us. Thank you for participating in communion. We serve an awesome God, amen. Well, listen, in a few minutes, Pastor Daniel's gonna come and he's gonna preach. So I hope you're ready. If you're not, just go ahead and strap on the old seatbelt because you need to get ready, all right? But listen, before we get to that point, go ahead and give your neighbor another high five. Meet somebody that you didn't get to meet the first time. And uh, thank you so much for singing with us, Chapel Hill. Over 4,000 years ago, one meal changed the future for hundreds of thousands of people. It was called the Passover. And this meal, which includes the traditional Passover Seder, has become an annual tradition at Chapel Hill. I'd like to invite you and your family, bring your children with you, and join us as we gather for a time of worship and a time of teaching. And we'll conclude with a delicious and amazing Passover feast. This special Easter week event is held at Chapel Hill in Douglasville on Thursday evening, April 18th at 6.30 p.m. Make reservations at guest services or online. Also at Chapel Hill, we bless, we support, and we pray for Israel. On Saturday morning, May 4th, we have the privilege of hosting a Stand With Israel forum at our Douglasville campus from 9 a.m. to noon. This educational event will have inspirational speakers, including Eric Stackelback from the Watchman TV broadcast, and every attendee will gain a deeper and a more accurate look at current events in Israel and the Middle East. There is no fee, but registration is required. Register now for Saturday, May 4th. The Bible says God will bless those who bless Israel. I hope you'll join us. Well, good morning. I just wanna remind you from our Passover encounter, it is this Thursday. And if you haven't already registered, well, you know what? I recommend that you move on it today. And before you leave today, stop by the guest services counter. Somebody there will be glad to help you get registered for that event. Well, my name is Matt Schaefer. I'm the small groups pastor here. And it's my privilege and honor to get to worship with you guys today on this rainy, but beautiful Sunday morning. How many of you guys got soaking wet coming in today? Yeah, okay, listen. 
We, we put people out there with our umbrellas and we try our best to serve you. And that's what we really wanna do. We wanna serve you at the highest level possible. And if you have any questions today about anything you hear or you need assistance with anything, our auditorium hosts, they're here, or some of our team members, they have white name tags on. They would have loved to assist you in any way that you might need them to or answer any questions before you leave today. If you are a first time guest with us, we are honored that you chose to worship with us. Before you leave today, we would love to connect with you. So if you wouldn't mind, please pick up one of those connect cards in the seat pocket in front of you. Just give us a little bit of your information. We don't wanna hassle you, but we do wanna serve you and help you find meaningful connections in our church. And so in a moment, when the giving containers are passed through your aisle, you can just place that blue connect card right there in that giving container. And this week, some of our team will be reaching out uh, to connect with you. Well, let's prepare to give as we continue to worship the Lord through our giving. And as you prepare, I just wanna say something, give a shout out to all of you who call Chapel Hill your church home. Shout at me if you call Chapel Hill your church home. All right, all of you guys, Pastor Dave is encouraging us, all of us, to make our plans and prepare this week to bring our best gift for next weekend's Kingdom Builders Easter offering. Me and my wife spoke yesterday and we're making our plans and we really hope that you'll join us in making your plans too, to bring your best generous gift next weekend on Easter. Let's pray over our time of giving. Father God, we thank you that you bless us in so many ways. Lord, you bless us, Lord, to make us a blessing. And so we pray and we command your blessing on every tither and every giver this morning. Father, we thank you that they will be uh, supplied for every good work in Christ Jesus. Lord, and that you will richly supply all of their needs according to your riches and glory. In your name we pray, amen. As the giving containers are passed through your aisle, you can just uh, pass it on down and just send it on the floor and one of our hosts will be by shortly to pick that up in just a moment. And again, thank you for worship, worshiping with us this morning at Chapel Hill. heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy, went and sold all he had and bought that field. We are pursuing treasure, something so valuable, something that's been lost, something that's been just out of our grasp. What are you missing? What is it you're looking for? Because I can't wait to tell you. I found. Good morning and welcome to Chapel Hill. Oh man, I'm excited to be home with you all today. My name is Daniel Gray and I am uh, just so excited to be back with fam. If uh, you're new to Chapel Hill, you might not know, but uh, a former staff member here for a number of years and over the past year I've been traveling uh, full time as an evangelist around the nation, around the world, preaching the gospel. And uh, there's still no better place for me to do what I love to do than right here at Chapel Hill. And so I'm excited to be able to be a part of this series that you're in. It's gonna be a great day. It's Palm Sunday, just one week before Easter. And I know in Pastor Dave's absence today, he would love for me to remind you of a couple things. And particularly, we'd love for you to remember that, this, that the times on Sunday for Easter are changing. So make sure you uh, make note of that. Take a picture of the slide if you need to. Get those new service times for next week on Easter. We hope that you'll remember that. And, uh, and also get some cards with those times and be inviting people to come with you next week. You know, statistics say that 85% of people would come to church if just invited by someone. How much more do those statistics fly and skyrocket on Easter week because uh, people are willing to, to say yes uh, on Easter and Christmas any other time. Just being practical with you for a moment, I'd love to encourage you, if you've never invited anybody to church, this is the week to do it. This is the week to use your faith and step out there. We're gonna have an awesome Easter. Can you say amen? 
Amen. I want to share a, a scripture before I get into what I want to share today. In this series, I found we've been on a journey now for a number of weeks, a, a journey of discovery, discovering something that maybe we lost or maybe something that we felt was stolen from us. And I'm excited because I'm talking about how I found my passion. I found my passion. When I found the kingdom, I found my passion. Matthew chapter 16, verse 25, before we pray. Matthew 16, verse 25, it says, for whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. Father, it's in Jesus' name. I come before you as a sacred servant, knowing that I'm just here to take dictation that what you're speaking to me do these lips of clay would be like words written on the hearts of men today. That's my prayer. God, I pray that you would open our eyes to see what we couldn't see before you enlightened us through the truth of your word. This is our earnest prayer. And in Jesus' name, some of what faith said, amen. amen. Matthew chapter 13, verse 44, it's on the screen. It reads, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure. Someone say treasure. It's like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. The treasure, as many of you are very aware after coming over the past several weeks and hearing this message, hearing the series on I Found, you know the treasure is the kingdom of heaven. It's the kingdom of God. But the parable shows us something really powerful here. It shows us that the kingdom is so valuable that it's worth giving up everything to get it. Because how many of you know as believers, when we lose everything, we actually gain everything. I know it doesn't make sense at first, but that's because it's a paradox. It's a, it's a kingdom paradox. And the Bible is full of these paradoxes. When you serve God, when you, when you follow Jesus, uh, the kingdom will go against the grain of what people say. Y'all not gonna talk to me this morning because it's raining. You know, because people will say stuff like, you know, uh, you gotta exhaust yourself. You gotta market yourself. You gotta put yourself out there. But the kingdom says that if you humble yourself, then God will exalt you. And by the way, in the right season, people say what goes up must come down. But in the kingdom, what goes down must come up because whatever a man sows, he shall also reap. It's a kingdom of opposites. See, see, people say you got to get everything you can and save everything you can and hold on to everything you can. But, but in the kingdom, it says that when you are generous and when you are a giver and you, and you release those things, when you give stuff away, then it will come back to you. By the way, good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over in my life. It's a paradox but that's what I love about serving God is that I'm not just like everybody else. And by the way, the things that we believe in this kingdom we serve in are things that have to go against the grain of what makes sense because we're not basing our worship to our God on just knowledge alone. No, we base what we believe on our faith. See, I faith my way through things sometimes because sometimes it doesn't make sense for me to do this and it doesn't make sense for me to go there. But God showed me the way. See, it's a paradox. I often share it this way with people, and you probably heard me say this before, but I'll say God doesn't have to make sense because he made sense. What are you saying? I'm saying he is the maker of heaven and earth. He created the laws that govern this thing. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I want you today to just begin to tap in to an area of your life that maybe you've lost. Maybe you've, maybe you've abandoned this area deep within the relationship with Jesus that you once had, this area called passion. People say about me all the time, you know, when I think about you, I just think about passion. I remember when I was in Bible school, we had to, at our graduation, everybody in Bible school had to tell the person, you know, one, it was one person at a time would come up, we all had to ex describe them in one word. And, and when I did this, everybody, passion, passion, passion. People were like, yeah, there's anything about Daniel, he's passion. He might drink too much Red Bull as well, but we know he's passionate. Everybody in the room is passionate. So when people say to me, oh, Daniel, you're passionate. Well, you see passion because you see me doing what I'm passionate about. But I'm not the only passionate person in the room. No, there are people in this room that are passionate about things that some of us would scratch our heads. There, there is someone in the room right now that is passionate about knitting. And that's great. Do I get it? No. There are some people in the room that are passionate about golf. 
Well, they're probably not in the room because they're watching the masters at home right now. People are passionate about all kinds of stuff. People are, people have passions. You know, we all know that in America, particularly, you know, I've had the opportunity to be a chaplain with the NFL team for a number of seasons, and I get to see people in the Mercedes-Benz Stadium, and they are crazy. They are crazy fans. Some of us in the room, we're, we're, we're passionate about a particular sport. Some of us in the room, it's not just a sport, maybe it's a particular team within that sport. Some people in the room, their passions are even more focused. Maybe you are a, a fan and a passionate fan of a particular team, of a particular sport, but even, even more so, it's a particular player on that team. Some of you in the room, you're not passionate about none of that. You're just passionate about the shoes of a player who plays a particular sport. Do you see what I'm saying? Our passions are as diverse as individuals. People are passionate about all kinds of stuff. Have y'all ever heard of these, these groups of people that they're called preppers, you know, doomsday preppers? Or, or some people actually, they, they prep, not just for like a, a possible doomsday, you know, or something to go awry in our country, but some people actually prepare for zombie apocalypse, you know? And when I first heard about this years ago, I was like, oh, what a cool hobby. And then I watched the reality show and I realized this is not a hobby. For them, this is really real. This is really gonna happen because they have spent thousands and thousands of dollars on preparing for something that could happen. So these doomsday preppers, they're preparing for the end of time. So they actually, companies have made money off these people. They're so passionate that company, there's a company in Nebraska that will build you a home, a custom home underground in a secure location and it will have sewage and electricity and water irrigation system enough food to last you years and some silver and gold for when stuff stop popping off and you got to go barter i'm serious this is crazy because people when they're passionate about something no matter how small even if it's just a single little idea when we get passionate about something we will put all of ourselves into that one thing when you find your passion, you'll give up stuff for it. You'll sacrifice for it. You'll sacrifice time. You'll sacrifice energy. You'll, you'll sacrifice your schedule. You'll put something into it that's beyond what you would want to if it was just about you because there's something greater than you. See, when I think about passion, I think about, I think about people who go overboard. Their people are passionate about collecting things. People are passionate about hobbies. We've talked about people that are passionate about sports. People are so passionate that they would give all of their energy and effort, all their time and money to preparing for something that possibly could maybe one day happen. Because passion, let's break it down. Passion is really a very, very powerful force. In fact, I, I began to look into this word and I found a Latin word. And I found a Latin word, which is the root of where we get the word passion. This Latin word simply means this, suffering or enduring. And that makes so much sense because passion, hear me, at its core is like a pain that has to be quenched. Passion at its core is that thing that makes you get upset with something that you're actually supposed to help with. See, I talked about this last night. Some people in the room are passionate about organization. So if you're in an environment that is not very organized, you get upset. You mad. Like, oh. How could they do this? They need to do this. If they had this, this way. And, and you're frustrated. And oftentimes what I have found is the things that frustrate you are often the things that you're called to. Because you have a passion for that thing. You, you can see when it's not right and you want to jump on that thing because you're passionate about it. So much so that you'd be willing to give up what you want now for that thing. So much so that you would say, I'm willing to lay down my agenda, my time, all that I am for this thing. In other words, I'm willing, hear me, to be inconvenienced for it. When was the last time you were inconvenienced by something you were doing for the Lord? When was the last time you, you had to endure something? You know the Bible talks about, if any man would come after me, Jesus said, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. One, one writer put it this way in the Bible, that we would share in his sufferings oh, so that we could experience resurrection power. See, there's something powerful about passion. Because the best way to know if you are passionate about something is whether or not you are willing to suffer for it. If you don't believe me, just ask Jesus. 
Oh, we saw the movie, The Passion of the Christ, but if you really understand the passion of Jesus, if you understand the passion of Jesus from the perspective of his suffering, then it makes his passion so much stronger because you realize he was willing to go through all that they would do to torture him. Hear me, Jesus was so passionate about you that he willingly took the nails. He willingly let them put a nail in his hand. He willingly let them beat him and spit on him and mock him and curse him and laugh at him. And then after they put a nail in one hand, he let them put the nail in the second hand. Now we got to understand that Jesus was God. And at any moment on the cross, he could have stopped it all, called the angels down and killed everybody. All he needed was some dirt and he could have started over again. Do you understand what I'm saying? But he was so passionate about you that he let them put the nail in the first hand the first hand I kind of understand but then to experience that kind of pain through his median nerve and then to let them put a nail through his second hand because of his passion for you and then to let them nail his feet to that cross and then to be lifted up on that wooden cross which by the way he created the tree that they carved the cross out of and he died there for you and for me because he couldn't stand the thought of an eternity without us his passion was so great that he says, I'll go to the farthest lengths for this. And while we see that passion, most of us, the most passionate people we see in our country today are not within the four walls of the church, but they are within the stadium walls of professional sports teams and movies and hobbies and all these extracurriculars. But I wanna ask you, ladies and gentlemen, is it possible, could it be possible that the world has outpassioned the church? Could it be possible that people with hobbies and interests in sports and fans, that they are more passionate about a team that doesn't even know them than the God who saved them and redeemed them and set them free? Do you understand? Uh, I'm passionate because I know what he did for me. See, sometimes the greatest way for you to rekindle and reignite that passion that you once had for God is to look back and remember where you were when he found you. Do you understand? Sometimes people say, Daniel, well, why are you so passionate? I'll say, if you could see me 15 years ago, you would understand why I'm so passionate. If you could go back and see me before Jesus came and found me. And, and see, the reason why I say it that way is because most of us, we say, you know, I remember when I found the Lord, but you never found the Lord because he was never lost. We were the ones who were lost and he came and found us. He came and found you. That's why the old song says, I once was lost and now I'm. So give God praise because you were found where you were. And by the way, when he found you, he didn't just find you, he saved you. When he found you, he healed you. When he found you, he empowered you. He gave you all that you would need to fulfill your purpose and destiny. And by the way, the things that you are passionate about are usually the greatest hints of your purpose. Jesus' passion was all because of his purpose. And sometimes the way you can know what am I called to is just to look at the things that you're most passionate about because they are like little blues clues about where it is that God is taking you into your purpose and into your destiny. Oh, I remember where I was when he found me, addicted, alcoholic. I was an alcoholic when I was 15 years old. How do you know that? Because when I woke up, I would shake until I got a drink. I had been incarcerated seven different times by the age of 17. My whole life was a complete disaster. One night I was in a car accident and at this, after this car accident, it was about 5 a.m. in the morning, the paramedics came to the scene of my accident and they had to cut me out of my mangled car with the jaws of life until so one of them noticed he stopped breathing. They stopped everything and they began to perform CPR, use the AED device and all of that on me and I lived through that accident. Six months later, because I, I didn't change when my accident happened, I didn't change, I didn't care. I didn't care that I had died because I didn't realize I had a reason to live. So I went right back to the same lifestyle, right back to my vomit as the Bible says. And then it was a few months later, my friend committed suicide and after my friend was gone and I was at the lowest 
point in my life. That's when Jesus came and found me. I know some of us, we got saved because of a sermon and some of us, we got saved because someone witnessed to us. But, but for me, my story is this. I was lost and I was broken. And I had no direction to go anymore. And I was tired and I was suicidal myself. But all I can tell you is that in that moment, I felt God ask me a question. He said, where are you? He said, where are you going? He said, what are you doing? I had no answers for God. But that's when I began to say, Lord, if you're really real, if this is really you, I'll pursue you. I didn't know how to say a sinner's prayer. I didn't know how to do any of that. Well, that was the beginning of my journey. But I can't forget where I was when he found me. I can't forget where I was. Broken, confused, lost, empty. I felt worthless, but he found me. See, sometimes you just got to remember where you were. Do you remember that altar call? Do you remember that? Do you remember that day when, no, like me, no one was there but you, but you got on your face before God and you said, God, if you will help me through this, if you will help me, if you will come and be in my life, I'll give you everything. And, and God answered your prayer and he met you where you were. And that amazing grace came into your life and you had such an excitement for it that you wanted to tell others about it. What happened? What happened? I shared in the earlier services that when I first got saved, because I was so radically saved, all I wanted to do was witness to people. And I don't say this to somehow try to pump myself up or try to exalt myself in this story. It's a story I'm gonna share. It's quite the opposite, actually, you'll see. But when I first got saved, because of this, 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 this encounter I had with God and God was beginning to work in my life, all I really wanted to do was tell people. I just wanted to witness. I was the Christian that was like, if I was around, I was annoying because I was like, oh, isn't this, this is weather outside, you know, but Jesus, he'll bring joy into your heart no matter how rainy it is. You know, I was that guy, you know, just looking for an opportunity to like kind of shift the conversation because I just, I just didn't want anybody to go to hell. I know this may sound kind of elementary and it may, kind of, it may sound kind of cheesy, but all I wanted to do was tell people about Jesus so much so that the church that I was a part of, Andrew and Tamara are part of this church as well at the time, Andrew and Tamara Dixon, this church went on a college, they had a college ministry that was doing a retreat to get away and go spend some time with the Lord and spend some time with each other, so I got invited. And I'm the new guy at church, so they invite me to go and they, they said, so we're going on a college trip. I'm like, ah, it's not my thing. You know, they're like, well, we're going to Destin, Florida. I was like, let me pray then. God says, yes, I should go. <laughs> and so I went on this trip to Destin and I, and I, and I mean this with all sincerity, Every day we would do these things, these, these you know, sessions and stuff. But at night, everybody got to go out and do stuff and have fun. You know, go to the beach, go to the restaurants. You know, we're all college career young adults. You know, we want to go out and have fun. But every night when they would go to do that, I, I just kind of would just play my cards. Like, oh, I'm just, you know, going to kind of do my own thing. But I was secretly going out to the gift shops on the street, on the street, on the streets there in Destin and right off the beach. And I, and, I, and I kid you not, I would go into these gift shops and I had no intention to buy anything. I just would go in there and I would see people shopping and I would just begin to pray, God, open the eyes of their heart. God, open the eyes of their heart. And I would just interrupt people while they were shopping and just begin to talk to them. And then I would share a little bit about my story and I would say, you know, just a couple years ago, this is who I was and where I was, but this happened to me. And, and I would pray for people and people would get saved in gift shops and I would go out on the beach. I, I'll never forget, I met these two teenagers smoking weed on the beach and I walked up to them and they offered me a hit. I said, no thanks, you know, I've been offered for like six weeks now. But anyway, I wanna tell you about Jesus. Cause I was new, okay. And people were getting saved and that, that was like normal for me. It was normal for me to do that. It was normal for, this is what I wanted to do. You wanna go play volleyball tonight? No, 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 I'm cool, I'm just gonna go walk. And I would go and witness to people because what I wanted to do, even at the beach on a vacation, all I wanted to do was make sure that these people didn't go to hell. I remember being on the beach and at the beach even, I would look out and see this sea of people down the sand, the sands along the beach as far as I could see it. All I could think about was how many of them won't go to heaven unless they hear. And can I be honest with you? The reason why I shared that it's because I can't remember the last time I went witnessing on the beach or in a gift shop or to my server at a restaurant. Evangelist, missionary, pastor, Reverend Daniel Gray. I have to get honest with myself if I'm gonna be honest with God and say, Lord, I've been more concerned with me I've been more concerned with my agenda 
and my family and my finances and all that I have going on, I've been so consumed with me that when I'm in a season of my life where I should be able to tell more people about Jesus than I ever have, but I'm consumed. And someone once said, if you're so full, if you're so full of everything that's outside of the kingdom of God, it's time that you let go of all of that because there's no room for God in your great big kingdom. How do you know this is true? Because we can go all the way back to when Jesus called his first disciples and we can see what really he requires from us. If we're gonna be passionate worshipers, Luke 5 chapter one, uh, Luke 5 verse one, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna read it all, but I wanna kinda just paraphrase some of this. But if you wanna write it down, Luke 5 verses one, all the way through verse 11, it's a powerful passage of scripture. I'll just paraphrase it by saying this, that first of all, the first thing we need to know that's important here is that this is Jesus walking up to the Sea of Galilee, also called the Lake of Gennesaret, and he is calling his first disciples. He is literally recruiting his first disciples, Peter, James, John. He walks up to Simon Peter and, and he says, is it possible that I could use your boat so that I could go out and preach from your boat to all these people who've been following me? Peter says, sure, takes him out on the boat. Jesus preaches an awesome sermon. Then he says, now Peter, I know you've been up all night fishing. I know that you guys didn't catch anything, but I want you to take your nets and just drop them in the water. Simon Peter did that. And the Bible says that when he did that, they caught such a large number of fish that the nets broke. There were so many fish they had to call their friends, it says, in the other boat to come. Now they got two boats and their nets are so full that they're breaking, they try to pull it all into the boat, then the boat starts sinking. A lot of stuff there that's biblical, don't have time to deal with it all, but what you see there is a couple things. The nets broke, that's breakthrough. Two boats, that's double portion, because God will always give you double for your trouble. And then the boat started sinking, that symbolizes overflow, that you can't even, there's not room enough for you to contain or receive what God is about to do in your life. There's gonna be an overflow that's not just for you, it's for everybody around you. All of that happened when Simon Peter did one simple act of obedience. Jesus says, I know this doesn't make sense. I know you guys cast your nets and all, and I know it hasn't worked, but I want you just to just drop your nets in there. Don't even try this time. And when he did that, and he just let go, instead of trying to hang on, that's when the miracle happened. Hear me, everyone in church, we, we wanna shout, we wanna praise God for the breakthrough and for the double portion and for the overflow, but not everybody wants to step out on obedience to receive it. Question I've asked myself this week, if I'm honest, the past few days especially, is Lord, have I missed you guiding me to people that I would have witnessed two years ago, but I don't even hear your voice in that area anymore? Yeah, you know how scary it is? Because I, I, I wanna hear the voice of God more than anything. That's why I read my Bible in the morning. That's why I pray, that's why I seek him. How could I miss? What's most important? A simple thought for us to think about every now and then is if someone died for you, wouldn't you wanna know about it? When's the last time you told somebody anything that has anything to do with your relationship with God? People that aren't in the church. <sighs> Father, I repent publicly for not being the witness that you've called me to be. I repent publicly. Maybe you're in the room and you feel that same conviction I feel and this week you would say, this is gonna be the week that I actually open my mouth and speak to people. Share my faith, talk about what happened. Do you realize that the last thing Jesus wants is for you to be quiet? It's Palm Sunday. And if you know on Palm Sunday what happened, then you know when Jesus came riding into Jerusalem on the colt, the Bible says that all the people there, they're waving their palm branches, they're making a way, they're praising Jesus, they're making noise, they're witnessing to the, to the, to the Messiahship of this man, the Christ Jesus. They're making all this noise and the Pharisee, the religious people, rebuked them and says, rebuke them and tell them to be quiet. That's what they told Jesus. Jesus looks over at the religious, the, the Pharisee, and says, I tell you the truth, if, if, if they keep quiet, the rocks will cry out in their place. 
Someone said, preacher, that's just a Bible story. How could rocks cry out? If I'm quiet, rocks aren't gonna cry out. Rocks can cry out very simply, the same way dirt can. Uh huh. You might remember that even Lucifer gave God praise when he was in heaven, but it was his pride that got him kicked down out of heaven into the dirt of the earth. And that's why when you praise God, you make the devil mad because you remind him that he got fired and you got hired. God said, I'm going to use a dirt man to give me a praise. I'm not going to let the rocks cry out in my place. I'm not going to let anybody open their mouth before I do. I am going to give my God praise while I'm in church. And by the way, when I leave these doors today, I'm going to be public with my faith. I'm going to tell people about the goodness of God. I'm going to tell people about the Jesus that can redeem them from the curse. I'm going to tell them about the power of Jesus to help them overcome every pain, every addiction, every problem, every challenge. Come on, if you've got some passion, and on the inside, open up your mouth and give him a praise. Come on, he said, don't be quiet. Don't be quiet. Sing. Sing, 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 sing. Some people would say, well, Pastor Daniel, you're a passionate person, but that's not my personality. I don't really, I'm not like that. Well, I have good news for you. The Bible talks about in Acts 4, how the Holy Spirit came on people in the church, people who weren't bold. And it says that those people, regardless of their personality, it says when the Holy Spirit came upon them, it says they spoke with boldness because the Holy Spirit gives you stuff you don't even have on your own. So it doesn't matter your personality. And isn't it funny, some of the people who say, that's not my personality on Sunday morning, they would be in church and say, I'm just not that passionate of a person. Then we find on the TV later on in Mercedes-Benz Stadium that they're standing there at the Falcons game and they got no shirt on and their chest is painted red and black and they're screaming at the top of their lungs and they're jumping all over the place, pulling a hamstring and they ain't even on the field. Oh, why? Here it is because you cannot be quiet about what you are passionate about. If you really have a passion for Jesus, you will wait for an opportunity, baby. You'll wait for an opportunity to say, oh, let me tell you about what he did for me. Let me tell you about when he found me. Let me tell you about when he lifted me up and he changed me. Only Jesus could do it. Only God could save me. Oh, if you believe it, lift your hands in the air and just give him a worthy praise. Come on, it's Palm Sunday. Lift your voice in this room. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Jesus said, go to the lost sheep. That was actually a command. Jesus another time said this. He said, if, 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 if there was sheep with a shepherd and one of 100 walked away and went astray, would that good shepherd not leave the 99 to go after the one? Why would he do that? Because it's the one that's separated from the whole group that is most susceptible to attack. And a good shepherd leading his flock from behind would know these 99 are moving together in the right direction. But there is one, there is one that has gone astray. And if somebody doesn't go to that one, they are open to attack or even potential death from wolves and from the enemy. My question is, is if he commanded us to go after the one, if he said, if you're a good shepherd, you'd go out, you'd leave everything, you'd, you'd let go of it all to go after the one then who's, who's your one this week? Greatest opportunity you'll ever have to witness to somebody this week. Who's your one? Jesus said, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, it's the sick. So go find someone who needs a physician and bring them here. Because you can't be quiet about what you're passionate about. Lord, open our eyes to see those who needs you desperately, oh Lord. I wanna close by doing something. I wanna close. I wanna close by praying for you that you would find that passion that you once had 
so much so that it wouldn't be passion that is hidden within the four walls of the church, but it would be evident to your coworkers and be evident to those who you go to school with, be evident to those in your family, it'd be evident to your next door neighbor. Some of you have neighbors and they don't have a clue that you even go to church. That's cool. I got neighbors too. I'm, I'm trying to be as transparent as possible. I got neighbors in my neighborhood. Most of them know I'm a pastor, but when's the last time I said, hey, I'd like to invite you to come to church with me. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Lord, I'll never forget the day you found me. Pray that each one of us in this room would remind ourselves of when you came and you found us. You gave us grace, you gave us love, you gave us a new life, you pointed us in a new direction. Some of us in this room, there, were, there was a moment in our lives where we thought it was over, we thought it was done, we thought it could never get better. And you changed everything. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I'd like to just share one thing before I pray for you. I wanted your eyes to be closed during this part because I want you to picture this. The story we just talked about in Luke 5 where they caught all those fish. The real miracle of that story and why I share it wasn't even about the nets breaking. It was about what happened after. Because it says in that story, if you go back and read it, it says that after this happened, they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything and followed Jesus. It's interesting to me, ladies and gentlemen, that it says they left everything because that means they left all those fish they caught, which scholars agree would have been over a year's worth of wages. They left the fish, they left the nets, they left their boats, they left all the equipment, they left all the money, they left their jobs, they left their careers, they left the family business that had been handed down generation after generation. Peter, James, and John, the sons of Zebedee, when they saw what Jesus could do in one moment to give them what they had been trying for years and decades to find, they said, this is what we really need, so we, we, we will leave everything on the shore of where he found us because now that I'm found, everything I was holding on to, I can let go of. Because the real revelation in the kingdom of God is that when you let go of it all, and when you sacrifice and surrender it all, that's when you find everything you've been trying to gain. With heads still bowed and eyes still closed, <laughs> If you're ready to leave everything behind and follow Jesus today, maybe for you it's the first time you've ever prayed a prayer of salvation, or maybe you're in this room and you've been saved and you've been a Christian, but you know you're not where you need to be and you're far from him today. If that's you, then I want you to respond to this message and I want you to respond right now by saying, I wanna give my life to Jesus fresh and new, rekindle the fire and the flame that was in me. God, that I would not just serve you more passionately, but that I would serve people outside of these walls more passionately. Oh God, that is my earnest prayer. With heads bowed and eyes closed, if you're in here and you say, Pastor Daniel, I would love for you to include me in your prayer right now. If you're gonna pray for people to be saved and changed, then I wanna be in that prayer. Right now, all you have to do is put a hand high in the air. I'm not gonna ask you to come forward. Hands are going up all over the room. Come on, shoot that hand up high so I can see. He said, I wanna give my life to Jesus. Hands everywhere right now. Right word, right time. In the name of Jesus if your hand went up all you have to do is just say a simple prayer and your whole life can be changed in one moment just say Lord Jesus I believe you died for me and I believe that you raised you were raised from the dead on that third day and so I give you my life tell him in your own words right where you are if you lifted your hand just pray just pray just pray to say Jesus I accept that gift that you gave and I latch on to the life you have for me. Oh, I'll never let go, I'll never let go, I'll never let go. Give me passion again. Thank you for dying for me, to give me everlasting eternal life, but also abundant life while I'm still here. When I found the kingdom, I found my passion. I found what I would be willing to suffer for. I found what I would be willing to sacrifice for. I found my passion in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, amen. Would you join me in thanking Pastor Daniel?
How many of you would say that something of the passion for the life of Jesus has been ignited in you today? Let me encourage you, on your way out, we have cards at each of the doors. Those cards are for the, for the specific purpose of giving you a tool to invite someone to be at church with you next week. Would you take that as your next step and take that passion and turn it into an invitation by using one of those cards? Grab those on your way out, and someone who you invite will be so, so glad that you did. If you prayed that prayer with Pastor Daniel, I want to invite you to reach into the seat pocket in front of you. There's a connect card there that we talked about earlier. On the back side of that connect card, there's a box that you can check to tell us about the decision that you made today. We want to walk with you and take your next step in starting a new life with Jesus. If you'd fill that out and share that with us, we would greatly, greatly appreciate it. Hey, we have an opportunity for you to join us on Saturdays between now and June 15th. Chapel Hill, because of your generous giving to Kingdom Builders, we're partnering with Habitat for Humanity to build a house. We're building a house here in Douglasville. And that house will be owned by a veteran. And so the opportunity for us is to join Habitat on Saturdays and construct this house. You can sign up by going to the website, clicking on the link, and there you can see a menu of Saturdays that are available for you to join us in serving. I hope you'll take advantage of this opportunity. This is Kingdom Builders Giving, making a difference right here in our community, and it's an awesome experience. Thank you for being here today. Our prayer partners are coming forward at this time. If you're our first time guest, the two doors at the back of the room are opening to our hospitality area. I'd invite you to stop by. We have friends there who would answer any questions that you might have. They have a special free gift to share with you and some refreshments. Thank you for being here. Before you leave, let me say this. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Have a wonderful week. If you need something for us to agree with you in prayer, please come forward.